That's it. It's fairly simple. Now, what have we done in terms of business registration in both export processes? I'm talking from the NRA point of view, the national revenue point of view, we are focusing on imports and export processing. The automation of import and export processes is in top gear, I must say that. A web based declaration system has been restored to collapse procedures and improve processing time for containers. Soon, the validation of import will be fully undertaken by all the custom departments of NRA. All those early business who could have very other. This will reduce both time and cost of carrying those. Of course, the, the tracking system currently is run by the Federal Port Authority, the TPMS and the Lab. But I'd like we are looking at so already there is a big request out to that other part of the generation of revenue to the government. But what we intend to do is to put a single window and fly in the year so that we should be able to fly the building in the hours max. This year, government will introduce the electronic tax register to help business with quick reporting and accounting of transactions and integrated tax administration items for domestic taxes to allow taxpayers to electronify returns and make payments, among other things. This will be rolled out this year. We will support the World Bank, we will, we will develop the national suite to promote interbank transactions and facilitate digital services. That is also expected to reduce the cost of doing business. The, the, the deputy governor will speak to that. The government also enacted in 2018 the Extractive Industry Revenue Act, which seeks to harmonize the fiscal regime in both the mineral and petroleum sector. That's been the case in the past, but in this family, it's given to the fiscal regime to different uh, uh, investors. The extractive industry revenue bill has and this, uh, company regulations to be put together to harmonize all those regimes. Of course, the president also mentioned the use of cost of the the, 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 the process of establishing the National Investment Bank. That will be the entry point for investors as a facilitate all processes, including registration and incorporation, land acquisition, tax education, and staff, as well as after care services. Now, we do not want an investor who comes to see and takes him one year for him to acquire a government land for investment purposes. Very soon that's going to be taken in the Again, as observed by the British Chamber of Commerce, one of the issues is the clarity in duty and tax exemptions. We did a technical review of the current duty and tax exemptions. We realized we fully then, as I speak to you, the policy that advanced the draft should be sent to Moraes and Mia on the, the draft duty and tax exemption. And the intention is that that should be escalated to the level of the legislation so that every investor know who duty and tax exemption that we grant to their, to their money first. But that, again, we have a caveat because different investment, and particularly the areas where you do on material investment, you begin with special concessions in investing outside the town. I mean, within the context of small town revival in the uh, uh, program. The government has recently enacted the Borrowers and Lenders Act 2019, which provides for the establishment and operation of the production registry. The central bank can provide the legal framework for the creation of perfection of security interests that are devoid of any formalities and <coughs> no necessary cost. Again, the whole objective here is to promote responsible lending and not the private sector to lend to the private sector. The major reason why the private sector do not so usually get access to finance is because they have problems with collateral. Infrastructure development is the top here. They spoke about that. The bigger framework, we talked about it. The issue of land we are yes. Now, quite a lot of incentives exist. I must say that. Let me just make a general statement on that. There are numerous incentives for investment in agriculture and manufacturing, including treating and tax exemptions on important input, raw materials and equipment. Additional concessions can also be negotiated on a case by case, taking into consideration the opportunities for job creation. Revenue generation, foreign exchange earnings, and consumption to GDP. 
Let me just be a concern to private sector. Let me just also make the general statement related to some of the amendments in the Finance Act. All concessions granted under previous act remain valid if we amendments of the act are made. As such, duty and tax exemptions granted for important materials for the construction of hotels for 2019 remain valid if such waiver is now eliminated. Only new investments are affected by amendment under any finance act. So I think that really is interpretation about that, that we did our investment plan on the basis of the exemptions. Now the exemptions have been eliminated. No, the exemptions are not retroactive. They come into effect from the day they have passed in parallel. Going forward, they will not be. But those that have been signed, you still, they can still continue with your investment plan. We have a lot of opportunities, I must end up by saying, we are talking about a market of over 90 million between the Manor River Union you Basin, know, over 350 million to airports. The infrastructure deficit itself is an opportunity, I must say. We innovative finance mechanism so that PPP gives up with and satisfies opportunities also as it's actually clearly recognized in government. The risking the business themselves are key. That's why we try to rejoin the the the, 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 the our relationship with Niger and the African Trade Resort. Finally, finally, this is the the greatest opportunity we have is the high level political leadership and commission. Let's make his office here and his wife for business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable So clearly, a lot being done uh, with a turnaround story uh, to return Sierra Leone uh, uh, to a part of, uh, of Marco's stability. We've seen quite a lot of results already on the fiscal front, as the Honorable Minister mentioned. Quite a remarkable performance in terms of narrowing uh, the fiscal deficit, uh, among other things being done. I think it's a good uh, time now to also uh, get a view uh, on monetary policy from uh, the Deputy uh, uh, Marco Sierra Leone uh, uh, Governor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's always refreshing when you sit next to the Minister of Finance and then he says, inflation is on target. That means I'm doing my job. <laughs> but um, there are, and, and that's a very important point because over the long term, we expect inflation to be in single digits. And our monetary policy stance is geared towards this to ensure that we have core inflation expectations and uh, be able to meet the regional requirements of single digit inflation. The Central Bank of Sierra Leone has um, the primary responsibility for monetary management in the country. Um, we manage monetary policy, but also financial system stability. We've got 14 commercial banks in the country. There are two discount houses microfinance institution, 30 of those. There are 63 foreign exchange bureaus. There are 17 community banks. And you know, a number of other financial institutions. The regulatory framework is quite standard. Um, we are very much plugged into the international financial architecture. We follow good standards, Basel-based standards. So if you invest in Italian and do your banking in Italian, you would not expect any different from what you get from standard you know, banking services in these parts of the world. Um, in addition, the central bank is strongly building its capacity. I'm very pleased DFID is here, and I'm very thankful to them. We're working with DFID and the Bank of England to deliver you know, capacity enhancement and development in the central bank. We have good regulators and good experts in monetary policy. Indeed, the regulatory framework, which I'd like to go into a bit, is being developed as we speak. Just recently, last week, for example, we have a new Bank of Sierra Act that has been enacted by Parliament and a Banking Act, which we hope as soon as the President gets back, he will give us a sense and that will become law officially. But both of these acts have upgraded our regulatory um, space to the extent that we can now have financial holding companies owning banks in Sierra Leone. 
but also a wide range of um, wide range of um, businesses and options for financing now available. In addition, we're working to improve access to finance and financial inclusion. This is a major part of our strategy over the coming years. We have recently launched, well a year ago, launched the National Financial Inclusion Strategy, um, which would give access to finance. We're doing a considerable amount of work on digital financial services, fintechs. There is a boarding sort of fintech um, group in Sierra Leone. We recently conducted a fintech um, challenge. We ran a sandbox. We're just about to enter our second cohort of sandbox. Our first sandbox focused on financial inclusion. And international firms are actually welcome to apply for this. We've got DFID through FSD Africa putting in um, some money there. UNCDF is putting about a million dollars towards this um, fintech challenge and sandbox for which international businesses can apply to be um, part of this exercise. But essentially, the sandbox this year will focus on revenue mobilization. So whatever innovations there are in fintech that could improve the government mobilization of revenue would be welcome to participate. The advert is still out, so I encourage um, you know, businesses to try and put for you know, applications for this. We've recently released our financial system stability report. We're working on, um, on, on a new one. Um, so the, the sector, the banking and financial sector is relatively stable. Um, key indicators for the sector of capital adequacy are still, you know, all above standard expected um, numbers. We have a problem of non-performing loans. We're supposed to be about 10%. In aggregate, the industry is about 13%. But we're working to reduce that. We've introduced a loan write off policy wherein, if um, loans are fully provided for non performing, they, they're written off and removed from the book so that we can clean up the balance sheets for our banks. And that we've been doing successfully. So the, 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 the incidence of non performing loan is coming up. But also, recovery. It's increasing. Um, the courts are helping. We have judgment um, for banks, and they are good recovery. So um, there's a quite there's quite a lot going on. Um, I'm very pleased to say that the system is relatively stable. Um, we will continue to have robust regulation, obviously, um, to ensure that financial system stability is sustainable, but also we will continue to create a permissive regulatory environment to ensure that businesses do not have unnecessary uh, hindrance to effectively operating from a financial sector standpoint. Um, I'm happy to take you know, questions and uh, uh, you know, provide more information on the sidelines of this event. But, in summary, just to say that you have a relatively stable system. You have a mature central bank that has capable people there with, you know, the latest you can think of in terms of standards and procedures. So um, I'll be very pleased to answer some more questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. <laughs> Sorry, so if there are any questions, uh, but we'll do that at the end uh, with, uh, after everyone has put the world in uh, for, for questions. Uh, I think you spoke about a lot of things being done on the regulatory side of things in terms of, uh, of the banking sector, the financial sector. Uh, on that note, I think it's a great time for Honorable uh, Christmas uh, coming to know what's being done just on the financial sector side of things. Uh, on the broader scale, what kind of the regulatory framework uh, to improve uh, uh, these, uh, the business environment and the of doing business, as well as, as what you could say, uh, all the fight on, on corruption. We've had a lot of that today as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim. Uh, thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me echo the um, gratitude to the organizers of this forum. I think it's um, timely. It's, um, it's time to start the conversation. I, I feel a bit displaced on this panel, but um, I think I need to be here because um, I, I need to talk to you, the investors, because we've heard about the rule of law. We've heard about predictability and certainty in doing business. And that requires a regulatory framework to provide that. So my job as um, Attorney General and Minister of Justice is twofold, is to give that predictability and certainty, but also to make sure that there's justice in the system, that the system provides a just mechanism for access to everyone, including our investors, our business partners, our small, medium term um, enterprises, and our people of Serenium, the public with whom every business person going to Serenium, investing there, has to interact with the legal or the new force of the investment has to affect them. And we are hoping this time doesn't take away. Um, I think the President's statement did address the um, regulatory issues that we have put um, on. The minister has um, referred to certain specific regulations. I do not want to have to comb for you the broad scale landscape of the <coughs> It has not been launched yet, but your, your perspectives have been noted. And I, I just want, this will be launched, but um, your perspectives as the private sector, the investors, not necessarily investment, has been noted. And I invite you to read between pages 26 Going backwards, I think is more well informed about the broader landscape of uh, what investment um, areas um, cover. That you, you, you could sort of like have that snapshot, um, and it also clearly um, defines the challenges that we have. So, what I want to do today, of course, I'm happy to speak to you about the incentives, the legal regime, the uh, recovery every sector of investment and the, the, the protection and promotion of investment, the fight against corruption in there. But I just want to use my time to, to address three things. First, to talk about the context of investment. Second, to talk to you about the challenges that I have called out from the British Chamber of Commerce that they have presented that inhibits uh, uh, the business review. And so sort of like, these are different, that we, 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 we incur both as government and as the private sector wanting to put investment. So I think there needs to be an amicable forum where we can, we can have this. So I, I, in, in, in relation to those, I will just highlight some of those that I just want to speak to, to give the context that we have in investment. We have private sector investment, and then we have public-private partnerships. I am important in this business because whichever way you turn around, it affects government business in some way. Whether it's going to be finance or the taxes that you need, the duty business. But I, as Attorney General, have to give my concurrence, my legal concurrence for the business from the policy making giving up government business right through to cabinet, right through if you want to make legislation or public, I have to give my concurrence and, and give an opinion in respect to most of these matters. Um, it, we, we have probably more, it's more, much more problematic when we talk about public, private um, 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 enterprises, PPPs, are slightly more complex because it is a marriage of two people coming together. And in most cases, the, 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 the government is not enhanced in a way that the partnership is equal. But my country, as I said, we want to speak, we want to have a dialogue, and it begins with openness. We have ground down the corruption. We are fighting corruption. For the first time in my country's history, I commissioned three com commissions of inquiry running concurrently for abuses of office and corruption in the public sector, and ministers, directors of agencies, and so on and so forth. 
but I do not think that is fair. Because in this corruption also is a condition of the public sector, of the private sector, of investors. <coughs> Contracts have been made, designed, agreements have been gone into that were basically corrupt led. And this drained our economy and our system. And as you hear, the minister has spoken, he's sort of like a dragging, but we know we'll get out. So I must admit, from where I sat as Attorney General, and I know more than most of what happens in the country and in these agreements and in these structures, it is disheartening. It is disheartening because it undermines the very basis upon which we are in partnership. So sometimes I'm a female attorney general, the first in my country. Sometimes I feel like a mom. And I'm, 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 I'm emotional about it because it cuts at the heart of what we do in government. So yes, that is sort of like the Context. Uh, this marriage between the public and the private sector, we have to be defined. We have to talk about it. We have to work closely. I am still making determinations which ones I slap to the Corruption Commission on Fraud or to renegotiate agreements. There are some that are, I put a freeze on. They are still, are still awaiting my, my legal opinion. Because it is just a, to create a just system means justice for all. And that is sort of like where I'm coming from. But I'm sure we'll pick up the dialogue. To move progressively starts by <coughs> acknowledging a wrong. We've all made mistakes. We, ran, we, 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 we move from that mistake to go to develop further if we own up that yes, things have been done badly. And we need to move from that and try to do things right. We want to work with you. We want to be able to create that environment with which you, in which you can come and operate safely. And make sure your bodies, your investments are secure and to have a relationship with us that is collaborating and, 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 and moving forward. So for the um, Chamber of Commerce, I've had you. You are concerned that um, there is lack of predictability and stability. There are overlapping and contradicting, conflicting laws, labor laws, interpretation of those laws, because it means you are having difficulty in the employment sector. A uh, high cost of, of enforcing those contracts for agreement and to uphold the rule of law and to provide less confidence. <coughs> we took over a very depleted economy. Mismanagement of, of public finance, governance at every level. And what I did as Attorney General was to shut down. Shut down meaning to be able to reassess what our relationships are. What we are doing, as I also make the investigations to was to weed out corrupt elements in what has um, happened. So, in terms of the relationship we have, we are working to to deal with this area, with these issues, how we can upscale our legal system. We have laws in almost every area. I think the only laws that we haven't got at the moment that are moving in that direction are competition laws. And commercial, uh, competition laws are consumer law. But the competition law, in fact, we are not having, and that's also a problem because we have some sectors heavily dominated and sort of like great. So you cannot have, you don't have many players, the same names. I mean, you put a, a, a scale, you see the same name, the same investors appearing. <coughs> I mean, you cannot just turn it blind and say that is normal, they are the only people who have money. So, of course, we need to, to have that competition framework. But then we also have this conflicting law. I will be talking with Diffie. I have been working with Lexis Nexis because we have a set of laws to develop a develop the concept paper where we need to be able to, to sectoralize our laws, not only to put them the broad scale of laws of Sierra If we sectoralize them, then we are able to weed out those that are conflicting, those that are obsolete, so that we can create and merge them and have something that is workable. That even from the ministry perspective, they are able to look immediately and know what is in their area. 
So, um, of course, I'm open. I think my time is up. I do not want to preach in rules and rule of law rules. So, but I am available to talk frankly, especially to the investors and, and, and purposefully moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, Christopher, uh, we've heard a lot from, from uh, the government side. A lot seems to be that leading down uh, to, to general things. Uh, as the president of the Chamber of Commerce, I mean, what, what, what is your take on, on what's been done and what are your members uh, telling you are the challenges they seem to still be facing? And, uh, where, where, where is the government getting it right? Well, thank you very much, um, Prime Minister. Um, I'm sure you've heard three public sectors. Uh, you're going to hear one private sector whose business is we just want to be able to make some money. <laughs> the more money we make, the more money goes to the Minister of Finance. I just want to make three because in my brief I got was economic overview and institutional and regulatory development. So there are basically three points I want to make. The first one is that um, the Salon Chamber of Commerce has some 415 plus members from large to medium, to very small individual people. And, you know, in, uh, let's take something, let's, let's draw a parallel, this is how engineers think. The single most important decision that anybody makes, in my opinion, is to choose a life partner. And the way it happens in Sierra Leone, your family gets involved. You know, as a man, you take your means of money and say, this lady, I want to get married. And then she gets together with her sister, her brothers, and they start looking into the family of the day. And the worst case you get is when they say, hmm, that's family. So investors coming to Sierra Leone, it has happened so many times. You get pleased. If you come to the Chamber of Commerce, we're in a position to do due diligence. We are in the country, we have a broader membership, so we can tell you who are the credible partners you're going to work with. Because it's not possible for an investor to come from overseas and just jump in and do business. You need to work with somebody. So we can help you choose, we can give you good advice as to who to touch, who to not touch with a 10 foot large pole, and who to be very careful of. So at least you're, you're well advised before you come in. Now the second point I want to make is that um, when you're doing business, it's not a bed of roses. You will come into, you will have issues as the public sector people have told you, the regulations, and um, you come into problems. But the thing is, if you're part of the chamber, if you, you alone go to the public sector and say, I have an issue with X, Y, Z, it's just one person. If you're part of the chamber with 415 members, you will say in the background, I will go forward. And how do you shoot 415 people in one go? It's well nigh impossible. So there's strength in numbers and there's a big advantage. And there have been, over the years, there have been issues we have raised with the public sector. Some have gone through, some have not, but at least you have a voice. Um, you're part of a group and you have a voice that you can speak and you will listen to. The third point I want to make is that Sierra itself is a small country with 7 million population, so it's a small market. But however, starting from the Manor River Union, which is the Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, and has now progressed to ECOWAS through the ECOWAS Trade Liberalization Scheme. You can have a manufacturing unit in Sierra Leone, and as long as you meet all the criteria that are set by ECOWAS about local content input into it, you have access to the wider ECOMAS, ECOWAS market, which is 200 plus, 300 plus million people. So that has immediately changed the aspect of doing really large-scale manufacturing business in Sierra Leone. And to give you a further example, Heineken <coughs> has been in Sierra Leone for 50 plus years. And they're not the only business that's been there such a long time. In the mining sector, Sierra Ruta, although it has gone through years ownership, is now owned by Luca, has been there also for about 50 plus years. And for those of you who did mathematics in sixth form, there's a theory called the you know, unknown equation of n is equal to something. If you can prove the formula is true for n is equal to 1, and you can prove it is true for n is equal to 2, the theory says you can prove it is equal for any number value you put to n. So if two businesses have been in Sierra Leone for 50 plus years, and they have survived, they have not run away, it has not been a smooth ride, there have been bumps, pitches, but that is part of the relationship. 
nothing is ever smooth. If everything was pretty smooth, it would be completely boring. But it is possible any other investor to come in. As long as you have, you know exactly what you want to do, well advised, due diligence is done on your partners, you have a clear business plan, it is possible to make it happen. So we are, we are looking forward to credible investors coming in, not for the short term, to make a quick buck and run away. We want long term partners for going forward. That is how the country's economy is really developed. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had from uh, our very distinguished panel, uh, uh, we've gotten um, insight into uh, uh, the economic overview of, of Sierra Leone, but we also got some lessons on how to get married uh, in, in Sierra Leone, so that was also very uh, exciting. Uh, I will open it up now uh, uh, to questions. Uh, I'm going to take about three questions uh, per round and then we'll, we'll get them answered and then come back on another call. Please uh, uh, try and identify yourself, name, and uh, if you feel recognized on you to, uh, to ask the question. Uh, I'm seeing one hand up. Uh, what I'm yeah, uh, there's another one there, so. Hi, hi, can you hear me? Um, good morning, my name is Sal, this is Um Firstly, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to the entire panel here from the uh, public sector and the private sector and uh, today for putting this on. Um, we've had some really, really interesting points from all of you. Uh, really positive message from all of you in terms of where, as an administration, we're trying to take the country forward to. Uh, it's a very welcome change. Um, the particular area that I wanted to focus on, I guess, covers a number of different points that you've all raised. And it's about this question of patient capital. Um, Honourable Priscilla Showers talked about the fact that um, what Sierra Leone is looking for are partners who come in for the long term. I guess um, the most interesting example of um, uh, an, an investment more recently that has demonstrated the failures of patient capital would have to be uh, the African minerals example in the mining sector, where as a nation we connected and put a lot of reliance on what was meant to be uh, an organization that would transform one of the most important sectors um, that drives our country's economy. I think it's a globally well-established and well-recognized failure um, that of course involved, no doubt, um, a significant degree of corruption. But I think what it highlighted to me um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, somebody who's worked in the city of London for 20, 25 years, and as a risk manager particularly, <laughs> is that the governance frameworks in place from a government's perspective, um, clearly, and this spans several governments, this is not a political point, it's about several governments, clearly were inadequate. So, I guess with um, um, the Minister of Finance in place, um, and with the uh, Attorney General and Minister of Justice, um, what I'd like to add, of course, Mr. Foster from the, from, the, from the Chamber of Commerce. What I'd really like to be able to understand is what lessons we've learned from that particular example um, and how this new government is going to be able to help us to prevent that from happening again. Because I think that is one of the things that puts off investors. Investors don't just look at um, uh, what, what happens. Uh,
Um, Africa minerals um, have learned, we have learned a lot in the field because what, what tends to happen is the sphere of the desert and that's the moon. We have one, two, three of scrupulous people in one place and two of and three <coughs> other places. And we have not quite stamped up clearly the African mineral effects because it's still a possibility to into other investments in the center. So we, 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 we know this and we are aware. And that's why when I was speaking to you, I said there was a freeze on the starting issues and we take we began taking steps already in some of those um um, um, um areas that we know um, completely um, inappropriate and um, we have decided to initiate our own due diligence. Um, in the past government had not had a mechanism for due diligence. When any investor comes and they jump in, the, 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 the death of corruption in the system makes investment not for country, investment for people. So it's either your minister, it's either the, the permanent secretary, it's either um, the director general or agency, whoever you can meet and pay the most, get things done. The attorney general's office just becomes um, sort of like as a matter of course. It goes to the attorney general's office. And people say, oh, it's a call to the attorney general's office. But not this attorney general's office. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, there, that causes a bit of delay. Because if we talk about justice and due diligence and making sure we watch out for government and watch out for our investors. Because when this marriage crumbles, the divorce price is huge. And no one survives it. Okay, and we do not want to do it. So therefore, we need to be able to look at it in a way that there is patience. Because my office, as I speak to you, you know, as I told you, know, I love being here. You know why? How many of you have been to the Attorney General's office in Sierra Leone? Thank you. Well, that office just crashed two months ago. And if I was there, I would have died. Because since 1965, we do not have office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Justice. So the face of justice itself is on scene in Sierra Leone. I mean, you have your Ministry of Justice and Care. I mean, this is just a law firm's conference room. <coughs> right? I do not have a conference room at the moment. If you have not been able to see me, it's because I'm embarrassed and hot desk in all over the country. <laughs> Where I can be able to find a state. It's not funny. It's sad. And we talk about all these potentials that we have. So I called, I said to the government, the Minister of Finance is here. I said, this is a stain on the justice of this country. If we cannot even boast of a ministry that's the call out. Second, the way the legal framework has been set, of course, is because we have really not been able to understand that the rule of law is important. And obviously, if the rule of law is not important, there is no preeminence given to it. Everybody thinks it's a matter of course. They tell you, all of a sudden, they are in fact. People make agreements from all sorts and bring it to my office. And I am the law office. They tell you we are understand. It is not about numbers, it's about commitments and commitments. So these are it's a, it's a whole measure. To create a system that doesn't mean come back today, do more of the same thing, you'll get the same results. So it is about sitting down, work with us, tell me what good experiences you have, tell me what you would like, tell me how we can change. But certainly I am not comfortable doing things that we need to be done. <coughs> because we just need to learn the same thing. Are we the ones to be doing that due diligence? Not necessarily. Legal due diligence we can do. To look at company structures, to look at company, other appearance company relationships and whatnot, how the, 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 the synergies will go. And of course, what happened to Africa when we are so distant? Far, far, far distant causes that when things crash, we have nowhere to fall. We need economic due diligence, maybe the Ministry of Finance can be the cheapest to start a thing. For this aspect, the dialogue we need to have, and we, we have made sure 
that I have ensured that um, my ministry tries to investigate and smell out the corrupt tendencies. I know the sector already. Fortunately, I have expertise in this area. I've thought of written and published in, in, in this sector. So I, I, I believe we, we have credible investors. I believe when people leave their homes and bring their money to our country, I believe generally they want to do well. They want to make money. That's necessarily the bottom line. They want to make money, right? But we also want to make sure that our people's lives change. So it is this conversation we could have. The public public interest bit versus the private interest. We have to think about this thing. Because whatever happens, it is for a win-win, as the president has suggested, stated clearly. It is a win-win situation that we do. So again, coming to the question, we are trying to do the legal due diligence. We try to find financial due diligence as well. And so with some investors we have to say, hey, go back and come. We are not passing this, we need this, we need this, we need this. I think that's just what's most fair. If we begin to ask those questions, if we begin to cut out the little men, as the Excellency has suggested, we have an investment board and are the highest of the contributors in that, in, the, in, that, in, that, in that board. So we are able to take, to protect investors. When we say, be satisfied that you are having this, it is of the highest. We also aid the process so that you are certain and there is a dialogue from if something is going on, there's always someone to come back to to be because long term investment, things change. We cannot really start starting for all time. So but there should be a, 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 a focus focus and an opportunity to dialogue and to do it. So it is not the shock of letting things fall, it is when you are not aware that they are falling. That is what is difficult. But we are taking steps and of course I welcome any suggestions. We are open for business, but we are also open for learning. Thank you very much. Corruption is always carried out of this. 
The time of the sense that you don't want to bother because they have too much time. The incentives, look like they don't have to sit Incentives is not the only thing that drives investment. It does problems. And the case by case, incentives are granted, depending on the location, the sector, and so on and so forth. But let me see when we talk about our culture. In the case of our culture, we have incentives to pick up tax exemptions and due to free import. If the, if the income of the company incorporated in CIA is derived from any agricultural activity involving rice farming and tree crop farming, such as cocoa coffee, oil plant, that company is exempted from tax for a period of 10 years from the commencement of the activity and 50% of any dividend paid in that year. A foreign company must allocate that these are the conditions for you to benefit without uh, income tax exemption. You must irrigate at least 50 hectares of land to continue, at least 2,500 hectares to qualify. So there are certain conditions, not that you give it to a to do more. Again, entities engaged in agricultural production shall entitled to duty free imports of agricultural imports for a period of five years from the date of first registration. In a country in post mean fertilizer, pesticides, insecticides, seed and seedlings, IBT, CD, DB, and Massive. Had a new machine here. So, if you want to, I've got to the best way when it comes to the sense. The sense are so good in our way. And to us, what our calculations is that our calculations are not very scarce. Lose the revenue from DT uh, and tax exemptions. When you gain it to payment of uh, payers in our tax as well. Because if you have an agriculture establishment that employs people, all these people that will pay you, pay you by you can see the revenue. And you can increase the household income, increase poverty. So, as I said, the incentive package can be very good, but I'm in a situation where I have to do the and I meet my IMF talent. So, it's a case by case. Why is we want to give incentives? We also want to make sure government revenue distribution is not there. So it's not like incentive for the to work. But as I said, studies are proven there's not only incentive. There are more critical issues related to the infrastructure, the legal and legislative framework. We are discussing barriers that we have to clear. But as far as the incentive is concerned, I want to assure you we are open to look at it. And as the position of commerce is suggesting, so yes, we want more engagement in public policy dialogue. I'm starting a round of discussion with different uh, 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 invest, investors and sectors to look at the existing 